All right, what's up guys? VV back with another video. And in today's video, guys, we're going to be doing a little bit of a brainstorming, theory crafting style video. We're going to be talking about value and um, just kind of a concept I'm working on, some kind of way to explain value. Because when you're playing cards for years and years and years, certain things make sense to you that might not make sense to a newer player. Now, this video is not only geared towards newer players. It's probably geared towards any level. You might be able to take something away from this video in, in one way or another. But that's what we're going to be getting into today. Just give you a heads up. And uh, let's just go ahead and dive straight into it. So the first slide here we're going to look at, and we're going to look at a game uh, later in the video kind of explaining what I'm talking about, like through a real scenario. But this first slide is going to be a little bit boring. A little bit. Of, we got to talk a little bit about concepts and ideas. So... At the, I'm just going to kind of read down the slide and we'll go from there. So determining value and generating advantage. Because this is a card game, right? We're trying to generate advantage, more advantage than our opponent has so that we can overpower them, overpressure them, and close out the game. So there are three different things in particular when you're looking at value. There is concealed value, which is like, you know, hidden value. It's, it's the cards in your hand. Your opponent doesn't know what those are yet. But every one of those cards has some sort of value or you would not include it in your deck, right? And the same thing with your life. Life is a card you're going to draw if you take the damage. And it's also something that you can, you know, it could potentially be a trigger or something like that. Okay. Now, potential value, this is your ongoing or onboard value. That's the best way I can explain that. Like, if we could just go back for a second. Like, Nami's, um, for those who don't know what this card is on the far left, she has an effect that when she enters play, she can activate it immediately. And every time she attacks, she can also activate it to generate more and more value, more and more card advantage. Okay? So that's what I mean by potential value. You have this, you've played a character on the board. It has some value because you can attack with it. And then it might have some ongoing advantage as well on attack effects and things like this. And then lastly, you have revealed or immediate on play value. So in other words, this would be like, you know, you played out like, so just to go back to the front screen again, you play out, raise you, you draw two cards, right? That's just immediate value. I played it. I got the effect. And now this card still has potential value. Because if it attacks, it could be getting a card out of your opponent's hand. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to examples. Okay, so at the very bottom here, whoops, I didn't mean to hit that. There we go. At the very bottom here, if you calculate all the cards in your life just as one value each, right? So a card in your hand is, like one card in your hand is one value, right? Two cards in your life, that's two. Three cards on the board, that's three. If you calculate all of them together, if you calculate all the cards in your life plus your hand plus your board, you can get this total CPR rating. And I know CPR has other, um, um, it's an acronym for other things, but CPR is what I'm using here for concealed, potential, and revealed value. So CPR rating or CPR value. And if you compare your CPR rating to your opponent's total rating, then you can kind of see like, okay, I'm winning or losing this game. Do you understand? Hopefully that made sense. And if you guys have any questions, please, you know, don't hesitate to put them down in the comment section below. So look at this board state here just as an example. So it's the beginning of the game. This gecko Moria went first. We don't need to know what cards are in his hand. Let's just look at the current state of the board. So they went second. They have two Dawn. They have five life, five cards in hand, and then they just played out a brand new for the turn. So this card, brand new, has immediately generated a value of one, right? Because by playing the card on the board, yes, you do lose a card from hand, but now you have a potential value card. Remember the terms. I know it's probably going to get a little technical, guys. At first, he was concealed. You didn't know what it was. And then he played out and got immediate revealed on play value by doing this top three search, right? And by doing that, you know, he, he replaced himself in hand immediately. So you went from having six cards in hand, because remember, when you're second, you draw a card and go up to six. He went, you went from going six cards in hand down to five, back up to six immediately from his effect. Now, there is some potential to, to miss on these searches, right? That happens. However, he still has his body on the board for potential value, and he also gives some hidden value some people might consider this potential value but i would consider it more hidden value by dropping these two cards into the trash the cards you can't search you see what i'm saying so that that is brand new is an excellent example of pretty much all three um values added into one so at the end of this turn here this guy you, you can't swing on turn one right so his value his like cpr rating would be like five in life plus five in hand actually six in hand because he draws the card and one on the board. So you went to five plus six is 11, 
plus one is 12. And then you have a little bit of hidden value down here into the trash, but we can't really calculate that because it has to be used in order to be valued. You see what I'm saying? And some of this is, you know, this isn't like a perfect science, guys. You know, I'm just trying to give examples. One more example. Let's use this example as well, where, okay, say you went first, but now it's turn two. So you went up to six cards in hand. You used your leader's effect to trash your Perona and then use, you know, trashing two cards from the top of your deck, playing out the Perona. And now listen to what Perona does. So this is some immediate value, right? When you play this card, you hit them for one card out of their hand, assuming they have five or more cards in hand, like for this example, right? So immediately when, when Perona comes into play, they have to trash one card for from their hand, excuse me. And, you know, you also got to generate some hit, some potential, I'll, I'll call it p potential hidden value in the future with these cards that are in your trash. You see what I'm saying? Because that generates, you know, that, that has synergy with your leader effect. So with, with Perona in particular here, you play this card out, you also still have potential with her because imagine this, say they cannot remove your Perona from the board. Okay, next turn, if you swing 5,000 power with this card, you're either going to take a card from their life or from their hand. So immediately she's generated even further value on top of being this body on the board. And then if they attack into her, she acted as a 2K counter to begin with. You see what happened? So in that situation there, she made them trash a card from hand. Then they made then this card made them trash another card from hand to counter out or lose a life, either one. And then lastly, it ate an attack up from your opponent. So it generated three specific like responses from your opponent. And, and that's a huge deal, right? That's that's massive. That is that is a large amount of value that this this card generate that this card generated. And the nice thing about Gekka Moria, of course, is if they do remove this card, you do the same thing, you know, all over again. Rinse and repeat. Okay. So real quick, so look at the board here. So just looking at, so this is the, we're going to use this example. We're going to watch this video in a second here. But I have this on the screen for a reason. Let's just analyze the board state. We're spectators. We don't know anything about these players. I mean, this is me playing, but let's just pretend we don't know anything about these players here. Just looking at the board state, we can actually determine who's winning this game for the most part. There are, of course, you know, uh, factors. There are uh, unknown factors that can change the course of the game. But just looking at it from a top-down view here, from a bird's eye view, both players have five cards in hand. Okay, so in the hand department, in, or uh, excuse me, in, in like in the hand zone, both players are fine. Now let's look at the board. Well, the player in red has three characters versus only one for the black, for the player using uh, Gekka Moria. Okay, but the Gekka Moria has three cards in life versus two in the opponent's, um, in, from the opponent, right? And now it is the Gekka Moria's turn. This is where the shift, as you see, like I, I, I uh, paused right here and took a picture for a reason because this attack is about to change everything. So let's just add everything up real quick. So five in hand, three on the field, two in life. So the red and yellow Bello Betty player currently has a rating of 10. That is their CPR, you know, the quote unquote CPR metric I'm using of 10. But we look at Gekka Moria, he has five plus three plus one, right? He has eight, five in life, or excuse me, five in hand, three in life, one on the board. Now, Again, it's not a perfect science or anything, but watch what happens here. This will determine whether or not you should block this card, by the way. Because this, you know, the Gecko Moria player here is attacking for six into, um, what's his name here, in Azuma. Now, if, think of what the Bello Betty player has to do to counter out of this. Bare minimum, two cards. Because it's a 6,000 attack into a 4,000 defender, right? So, in that case, he'll have to trash two cards from his hand just in order to, you know, to stop this attack from destroying his character. So immediately, it's pretty much not worth it, right? Because remember, it is the Gecko Moria's turn, and he still has five Dawn left to work with. So, so again, if he defends out with two cards, a 2K and a 1K, he will go down to three cards in hand, three on the board, and two in life. So that would be three, six, eight. Well, right away, without anything even happening, the Gekka Moria, Moria player is already up in advantage from that because he is at five cards in hand, three in life, one on the field. That's nine. So it becomes nine versus eight, and the Gekka Moria player has not finished his turn. And look at look what's in his hand, guys. Luchi and a, excuse me, and a uh, Great Eruption with five Dawn left. So this guy is in a lot of trouble if he tries to counter out of this attack here, right? Okay. So let's go ahead. We're going to look at that game real quick. Actually, 
yeah, we, we are going to look at the game. I'm sorry. Let me, uh, I was going to say, we might want to go further with the slideshow, but first, let's look at this game. So this is the game in question, and I'm going to kind of break it down. Let me hit play. Okay, we're, we're going. Make, let me make sure we're in 2x speed and the volume's off. Okay, so, so right here, just to start the game off, th this is one thing I will say. Let me pause right away. This is one of the reasons, by the way, like, like this kind of logic. And again, this isn't a perfect science. This is just one way that I see the game. This idea of of card advantage, right? This was one of the main reasons I was not a big fan of multicolored leaders having one less life card than their opponent. Because what ends up happening is you'll have to combo X amount of cards in such a way that you can generate, you know, far more uh, advantage over your opponent over the course of the game. Well, that becomes very hard for developers and designers to balance. So, all right, so let's, let's keep going into it here. So looking at the board right now, let, let me uh, let the Velo play out their entire turn, and then we'll pause it on um, the Gecko Moria's turn. Okay, he takes that, Paul. All right, so boom, pause. So with four Dawn open, just just judging the field by what it looks like here, the, the Velo Betty has six cards in hands, four in, in life, and two on the field. So they have about a 12 rating right now, 12 value rating right now. Then we look at the Gecko Moria. He has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and plus four in life. So that's 12 as well. They're pretty evenly matched currently. So let's see what happens here. Okay, so we're gonna swing, you know, the, the Gekka Moria swings, use, uh, use the Ab Absalom's, Absalom's effect, excuse me, and remove the character. Now that, and now it's the Bella Betty's turn. So we'll pause it just, this is perfect. So this player, notice no cards went away. He still has 12, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus four is 11, plus one is 12. The Gecko didn't lose any advantage because he, he played out a character that now has more potential value, specifically potential value. He could attack with it or do whatever. Then we look at the Bella Betty. They lost one character, but they drew up a card for the turn, so they should be back to 12 as well, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So the game is still very even, even though the Absalom just smacked one of the cards off the board. Things are still very, very even in this regard. Okay, so let's see what happens. So the Inazuma play comes out here. Swing for 7,000. So, okay, so, so the, and the Moria takes it. Then Inazuma for, for 7,000 more. They use, notice that there are no 2K counters in the Gecko Moria's hand. So this Inazuma play ended up generating three cards of value. Three, like specifically. That, that is a large, large advantage for that card because it played itself and swung. And in order to get out of that attack, the Gecko Moria player here, which is which is me by the way, I am playing this. Um, the Gecko Moria player had to trash three cards to get out of this. Okay, and let's hit play, and then five more should be able to counter out of this with the Helmetho. And that was a major shift in in the in the game, right? Because now look, so let's see what the Gecko Moria player has to do to catch up at this point. So now, so the now they did have to the uh, Bello Betty did have to trash a card from hand to give those characters that power boost. But we're looking at 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. They still have 11 points of rating, quote-unquote, right, with the little metric we're using. Whereas the Gecko Moria is now down to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And that's after the draw, right? So, so the Gecko Moria has a lot, a lot of room to make up here. Okay, so let's see what happens. Swing 5 at leader because, now let me pause it, because what was going to happen there was... You know, I was obviously going to use Rob Lucci to care the two cards on the board, right? I attack into life, and it generates a card with Lindbergh. But Lindbergh does force you to trash a card in order to get his effect. So that ended up being a minus one, even though it got a body into play. That's, you know, they, they do that in, for, for momentum reasons, obviously. But now let's reevaluate it. So five plus five. So this is down to ten in the little rating department here. And this is the example we see in, that we saw just before I turned on the game. So I swing six into the 4K in Azuma. Let's see what they do. They counter out. So that means they had to use a 2K and a 1K. So now they're down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're down to eight now. Okay. So I'm gonna. So I use Great Eruption here. Use out the the um, the Luchi and pass it back. So at the start of this turn, at the start of the the Bella Betty's turn, after that Rob Luchi play, now they are up to. They're down to seven. But you see, I they're. It's becoming worse and worse. This is getting really, like, it's starting to, the, the favor is starting to turn widely or wildly into the Gecko Moria, right? Because they have one, two, three, four, five, six, plus three is nine. So it is a nine to seven advantage, and that's after the Bella Betty's draw turn. So, so let's see what happens here. 
And there's, of course, there's always going to be other factors, by the way, guys. I want to preface that. Like, if they can just rush you down. And by the way, let me say that. that That's kind of what I'm implying. Is the Bella Betty is so far behind that it's almost time for a Hail Mary, right? Where it's like, okay, we, we just got to go all in on our opponent here and just try to win the game because they have outvalued us at this up to this point, and now we're in trouble. If you ever have a question of when you should swing for lethal or like try to go for lethal, this is a good method to use for that because the, the Bella Betty is up against the ropes at this point. Okay, so he plays out Inazuma, plays that out. See, now that's nice. That will allow, allow him to start eating some cards up off my board and getting value that way because let me, oh, let me let that play out. Remember, even though he attacks into my life here, that attack was for 7,000. So normally that would elicit two cards from my hand as a response to stop that attack. But I used my, you know, my, my uh, a secondary resource system in this game called your life, which means that I'm not going to block out of any of that 7,000. I'm just going to get it to my hand. And it's still, a, 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 how do I say this? It still has potential value, even like this unrevealed, this hidden value in my hand. And it totally ate up that attack. You see what I'm saying? Like, I know that might have been complicated, but hopefully hopefully it made sense. Okay, and then he passes. Now, honestly, he he kind of pulled the trigger a little early by, by trashing the Lindbergh, in my opinion. But I don't know what his hand was, obviously. It, it, it always depends. But in this situation, it looks like I'm up to 8 Dawn. And I can start playing out my 8-cost Gekka Moria. Or, or all kind, I have all kinds of different options at this point, uh, depending on what's in my trash. So swing 5 into him, seeing if he has any counters. Okay, he takes that. I'll play out Gecko here. I think I get back a Hell Mepo and uh, yeah, and, a, and a Absalom. Take out the Karasu, and now the board's mine. And now look, now look at the difference in value. By the way, Gecko Moria is a card that generates massive amounts of value, right? Very large amounts of value. So in this case, my opponent is down to two, four, six. They're down to six overall CPR rating, like that little system I was telling y'all about. That's all they have is six. Whereas right now, as as Gecko. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus four, eleven. So it's eleven to six right now. This turn has to be devastating from the Bello Betty, and as we know, they kind of have to go all in at this point. They don't. They don't really have the option to just stick in this game. They don't have the value. They don't have enough card advantage to stick in the game at this point. Okay. Let's see what they do. Trash a card from hand to give all their guys plus three thousand, which that's a great idea. You got. You got to make up room somehow, right? So he swings in for eight, swings in for seven. I take both of them so I can bait out into this 2K, 1K counter on the leader. Because remember, they played Emporial Ivankov this turn. So they can't attack with that card. It does not have rush. Okay, and again, they, they tried. That was their only option. And then they tap out because there is no, there was no other option. They, this is the card they had in hand. They had the uh, the four-cost Ivankov, not the five-cost. They had the four-cost in hand. That was their only possible way of winning at that point in the game. Okay, so let's go back to the slideshow real quick and we can wrap up from there all right here it is so certain cards like i said just to go back real quick there, there's really three major areas of value in this game and, and, and again this is just my opinion this is just my own little study my own way of uh, kind of determining how value goes in the game there's probably a way more complex way of looking at this because th this is just a basic way of looking at it there's got to be a way more complex way of looking at it that we'll talk about a little bit later but this this is at least good to get people started and you guys tell me what y'all think in the comment section below on this. But with, when it comes to brand new, one thing that's just incredible about brand new and Spandam for that matter is you're playing out a body, right? It's a 1K counter in hand, so it still has that hidden value of 1K counter. But you're playing out a body that does a top three search. So it might replace itself immediately, but it also fills up your trash. You can't overlook that you know, that hidden level of value there. It's not, I mean, it could be potential value in the future with Gecko Moria or with Rebecca, but it is hidden value straight away. So this is a very, very valuable card. And I think it's one of the main reasons a lot of people run this in pretty much any black deck now. Any deck that's running black now will run this card because of the synergy it has around it. Perona, similarly, we talked about this as well. Okay, with Perona, say you play this out, like, like in the example we showed right here, where you just play it out just like this. Okay, this card, as soon as it entered play, it replaced itself, right? Like in, 
in an inverse way. Instead of you drawing a card, you made your opponent trash a card. I know that's not exactly the same, but it does, you know, for the sake of math, it is basically the same. If I'm plusing one, that's good, and, and it's just as good as if you're minusing one. I'll take either one if you're my opponent. You know what I mean? If I'm plusing one or you're minusing one, that's fine with me. In the meantime, I've established a 5,000 power body, and now you have to answer that as well. You know, and I won't even go into, like I said, there's like an advanced metric that I don't, I don't know, it'd be really hard to conflict, uh, uh, to calculate, but there's an advanced metric of like, you know, what Gecko Moria does, getting cards back from your trash. So even if they KO this card, it still retains value by being able to get out of the trash. You see what I'm saying? It's very, very powerful in that way. So Perona, very, very strong. After you play it, you establish this 5,000 power body, they trash a card, and now next turn it might attack and get another card out of their hand. Or if they remove it with something, like even let's even say it's a Hound Blaze, right? Let's just say they remove it with a Hound Blaze. Okay, that's fine. But they had to use a card from hand to remove it still. You see what I'm saying? So very, very strong, uh, very strong card, very high value card. Same thing with Raiju. Raiju is a four cost, 5,000 power card, has the 1,000 counter. It has like these very powerful um, value areas, you know, areas of value. And then as soon as you play it, this card generates immediate value, right? As soon as you play this card, you're drawing two cards. So when you play it, you're establishing a body on the board that has further potential value, right? Because they have to remove it or ignore it. Like that's the only two options. They either have to remove that card or they have to ignore it. And now it's generating more and more potential value. But it generates immediate value by drawing two cards. So if you have five cards in hand and you play this card to go down to four, you go up to six, while establishing that body. So very, very uh, high value card. So um, talking more on the advanced side of this idea, there are cards that have different, you know, these are just vanilla cards we're looking at on the screen. And this one card, two card, three plus that you're seeing on here, this is how many cards bare minimum that is required to answer these cards one attack. Attacking just one time with a 5K or 6K will elicit a 1K or 2K response. Not counting events, by the way. Sorry, guys. I'm not counting events in this in this specific example. Now, with a 5-cost or a 6-cost character, if they swing for 7K or 8K, you're basically going to have to drop a 2K and a 1K or a 2K and a 2K to get out of that. So you're, at bare minimum, getting two cards of value out of their hand. So you see how these cards... These are cards with no immediate value, but with potentially very high, or, well, I, I'm going to repeat myself, they have very high potential value. That's what I was trying to say, is they have, when you play them, yes, they're, they're already good as is, as a very strong body, but they don't have any immediate effect to help you retain, you know, retain board control or advantage or anything like that. You're basically putting down a, you know, you know, putting up money up front to hopefully get something in return later. You're, you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to, Put this card down now so that it can hopefully pay for itself on the next turn. And it might not, right? It might it might not pay off. They might remove it before it can generate any of that potential value we talked about. And then, of course, for seven cost or higher characters, they usually elicit three plus cards just to stop the attack. Okay, just to stop one attack. That's kind of what we're going for here. Okay, so just to go over some more uh, like examples of immediate potential and uh, hidden value, that's what we're going to look at here. Cards that have immediate value... There are even types, right? Any kind of rush type character, when you play that card, you can immediately get value from it. Not only, not only, let's let's use Zoro for a minute here. When I play Zoro for three cost, he gets to, so I've established a body that has to be dealt with, right? Or, or you have to ignore it and then it generates infinite potential value, right? So, so I, I play out the Zoro, I attack with it, it gets immediate value. So when I played a card from hand, it got a card out of my opponent's hand or got one of their characters, or lastly, it got a card from their life. Those are the only three options, right? And, and that's fine. So now the card is already essentially paid for itself. Now, if they remove it, it just got another card out of their hand. But if they can remove it with a leader attack or a character attack, that's where you start getting into the complications of should I defend out of this or should I let it go? And, and that does, you know, that, that's going to come down to each individual situation. Uh, putting or any searcher, they get immediate value. You play them, you draw a card. So you're you're playing a card on the field to generate some momentum, some more potential value on the field, but you're drawing a card in the place of it. So it immediately replaces itself. These that's why searchers are so good in one piece. D typically speaking, searchers are in almost every deck, right? Okay, now for potential value, if you play out this Monet on the left here, 
Blocker is a very strong keyword for potential value. So is double attack. Double attack has a lot of potential value. It might not do anything, right? They might KO the character or bottom deck it before they even have a chance to make something happen with it. Or if you get to attack with it, you can take two life, you know, cards from them. You're, you're removing one of the one of their their hidden resources with their life, right? Which is which is very powerful. It's getting you that much closer to your win condition. Blocker is, is similarly, uh, you know, or excuse me, blocker is also a very you know similar effect in that you have potential value in it. Now again, if you play down a blocker, they might just remove it before it even gets to block. That's why I call it potential value, because it might not get any value outside of, well, I shouldn't say it, it won't get any value, because whatever card they use to remove it, that's still technically at least some type of value, right? So that, that's, that's pretty nice. And on block and on KO effects are also potential value. Okay, with Kika Nojo over here, like, you know, if, if she gets KO'd with three or less life, you can gain a life. So that's, you know, again, think of it like that. If you play out this card, and then you attack, so it, that, at that point it pays for itself, but then if they also KO it, it ate up another attack, so it, it, paid, it, it generated an additional point of value by eating up that attack, and then lastly, when it got KO'd, if, if they had three or less life, and you generate a life from it, it just generated three points of value. You see what I'm saying? Like, or at least potentially. It, it all depends. That, that would be like a high, a high value situation. Okay, and lastly is hidden value. I would consider triggers, like like what you see down here with Kika Nojo, triggers are hidden value as well, at least in my, you know, in this this theory we're, we're, we're talking about, this concept. Um, but like with Spandam and Brand New, they have hidden value. Like, yes, they, they get their immediate value right away. Like when they play it, you get to do a top three search. But the fact that they're filling up the trash for later, that is hidden value that your opponent really doesn't know what you, what you can even do with just yet. So that is like an extra level of um, value on these these kind of on the searches for the black cards. Okay, then Miss Wednesday here in the middle. This card, Dawn minus. It, okay, let me let me back up. It's a three cost, four thousand power blocker. First of all, this is coming out EB zero one in about a month for us. It's a it's a three cost, four K power blocker with a one K counter. So it has potential value. It has all the value we talked about, but then it also has like this hidden value where if you combo with a purple yellow leader like Crocodile, when you use her on attack, on your opponent's attack effect once per turn, when you return one Dawn card from your field, you're getting a Dawn card from your leader back as active. But look what she does. If your leader type includes Baroque Works, you get to add up to one Dawn card from your Dawn deck and set it as active from her effect as well. So just a double effect. So there's like this hidden level of value in there I would also consider uh, Dawn ramping or Dawn minusing hidden value. Like, if, like for example, with Magellan right here. The reason I have him there is because if you if you reduce your opponent's Dawn, you're slowing them down. That's a hidden form of value. It's not even necessarily like potential value or immediate because they can still play next turn, right? They still have cards they can probably play next turn or load up cards on their their characters or leader and attack, and, and y'all get y'all get the idea. But it does have some type of hidden value where now they can't ramp the way they wanted to or maybe the way they planned to. Uh, Kikinojo, we talked about enough. Uh, but with this card here, it's called Oh Come My Way. This is another like hidden value card. I would consider most triggers and most events as like this hidden value idea that we're talking about. Uh, and again, hopefully that's not too confusing. And then lastly, this is like the last slide here, just talking about how Ultimately, there are there are there are monsters in this game or characters in this game that are just value monsters, right? Like we said with Reju, Reju is a four cost, five thousand power character, right? That's already fine because it has a body that can attack with no dawn investment and elicit responses from your opponent. But it also is a one k counter, and it also can potentially and oftentimes will draw you two cards. So that that is extremely high value. Over to the left here. I don't even have to explain Gekka, Moria, and Rebecca. These cards generate such a large amount of value, right? Because your recurring effects, you know, like with these examples we were talking about, you know, if someone swings in with Zoro and they have to trash a card from their hand to stop the attack, well, if it's Rebecca, guess what? Or if it's someone running a deck that runs Rebecca, Rebecca can be played and get that card right back out of the trash and get it straight back to your hand. And it's a blocker now with more potential value. And then Gekka Moria, like I said, this is a card, as soon as you play it, number one, you have a 9,000 power attacker, which that can't be blocked unless they use, or excuse me, countered. A 9,000 power attack cannot be countered unless they use at least three cards from hand, right? Again, not, not talking about events. 
So, so that, that alone establishes a body that will create a lot of potential value. And then lastly, it can play out, or probably most importantly, it can play out a four cost and a two cost, or up to a four cost and up to a two cost from your trash. So back to that the hidden value from a card like Spandam, you're putting these cards in trash that you might be able to reuse later with a card like Gecko Moria or Rebecca. Okay, and then Big Mom, same thing, Charlotte Linlin, she, she's, she's the same idea. She's a 10 cost, 12,000 power character. Those stats alone are intimidating and hard to deal with, right? But also, when she comes into play, your opponent loses one life without being able to use any hidden value. So, so you know, you're, you're effectively trashing a card from their life and you're gaining one life in the process. So this is a card with a very large momentum swing. And I didn't have the card included on here, but like cards like Lucci, Rob Lucci, and even cards like the new seven cost um, Raging Tiger, uh, whatever it's called, Gravity Blade Raging Tiger. These cards that are two for ones, those are very important. And the cards you see on the screen here, all of these are bare minimum two for ones, basically as soon as you play them, right? Because even Nami, say you play out Nami, three cost 5k. And, and, you know, let's say you have four Dawn, so you can actually draw the card with her effect. So she replaced herself immediately. And then if they KO this character, the, the Nami on the left here, by using an effect from their hand, okay, that's fine. You know, they just two for one. They just allowed you to two for one them with this Nami. But, and, and it's smart for them to do that, right? Because if they don't, then you're going to generate even more value over the course of the game with this character's effect whenever she attacks. Okay, and Prone and Rage, we already talked about pretty extensively. All right, guys, that's about it. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to leave those down in the comment section below. It's been a while since I've done one of these uh, brainstorm theory crafting style videos. And value is one of those things that's just really, really important. And like I said, this is just a basic um, introduction to, to interpreting and calculating value. Like when you should or shouldn't attack. Or, or excuse me, counter out. Or maybe when you should go all in. When you've determined like, wait a minute. Because of the, the current board state, like let's go back to the one example, because of the current board state, maybe I have to go all in, it's my only chance. Maybe not. You know, Again, it's going to come down to each specific game and each specific situation. And, and I think once you learn how to calculate this kind of value, value, you can really take your decisions to another level. And I think the, the, the good players out there, like the really good tournament players, the pro players who are always you know doing well in tournaments or doing well at your locals, they already understand this but they probably just don't know how to explain it. And hey, even I, I don't even know how to explain it perfectly. Hopefully what I did was enough for you guys to, to get a good idea of what I'm talking about. It's not an easy concept to explain, but once you understand it, it starts really making sense. Okay, well, that's about it, guys. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it on uh, this last one here. To, or actually, I'll leave it on the little title screen for, for the uh, end of the video. Again, if you got any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to leave them down in the comment section below. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, until next time, guys, peace.